computer. All right, here we are today after Thanksgiving and Alex and Jim are recording episode six of Alex and Jim Analyze Billy Joel lyrics. I love uh, that we still are saying, using the word analyze. <laughs> All right. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's a, yeah, maybe a misapplication of the word, you're right. <laughs> Discussing, I mean, I guess ultimately it is analysis. Yeah. Um, uh, Alex so. and Jim roughly mentioned Bill, Billy Joel lyrics. <laughs> <laughs> While telling stories about the days of old. <laughs> well, it was pretty funny because last episode, uh, Alex brought up uh, Running on Ice and uh, just wanted me to see if I could sense the influence in the song. <laughs> Lord, it's so funny how obvious it is that it is a, uh, you know, it's a U2 song. No. <laughs> <laughs> it is so much uh, early uh, police song that yeah. I said that it was off the album Ghost in A Machine. <laughs> Not the machine, because if it's a Billy Joel album, it's a ghost off a ghost in a ghost machine. In an adjacent machine. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, it uh, it's glaring. You're it's right. glaring to the point where it's on it's on the album The Bridge. Yeah. Which he has said was uh, an album where he wanted to stop being such a, a hermit and work with other artists. And there are a lot of duets or several duets on that album. And uh, he does a song with- um, Ray Charles? I'm forgetting names. Ray Charles for one thing, Cindy Lauper is on there. And then what's his name from Traffic? I'm forgetting his name. Oh, this is terrible. It'll come back to me or I'll Google it. <laughs> subtly while you're talking yeah <laughs> uh, and it, it feels like maybe he thought oh i'll write a policey song and reach out to sting and see if i can get him on this album and it didn't happen and sting probably was like don't do that that's <laughs> this is a little creepy <laughs> uh, this is my guess i'm making up a little story for myself where he like called sting and said hey i wrote a song like you guys do yeah <laughs> let me play it for you and then sting said don't do that what i first of all i don't do that anymore <laughs> yeah right <laughs> this, is, this is later than that i'm the fields of gold guy now um and, I and guess... yeah so i feel like it was a missed bridge yeah i and guess said, oh fuck it i'll just do it I guess he didn't want to just get Stuart Copeland or something, which he could have maybe done it that way, but probably you, could have done that. you probably want Sting with all due um, respect to the rest of the members of the police. I'm being reminded of a very uh, weird story from a friend of mine who, this is a full sidebar, a friend of mine who works on our show um, has kids in a very hoity-toity, like children and for the arts, preschool slash kindergarten. So a lot of youngsters um, and, you know, elementary school and they uh, had a talent show. Sure. So they pulled together a little band, his son and a couple other people. And one of the parents played the drums uh, and someone from the faculty was watching the rehearsal for this and was saying, dad, do you have to slow it down on the drums? These kids, you know, they're learning the instruments. They're, they'll keep up with you, if you but you got to slow it down. And the end of the story is that the dad was Stuart Copeland. <laughs> <laughs> like you're, you're really overshadowing them. There's too much syncopation. <laughs> uh, and he was like, okay, I'll try. <laughs> and did not tell the faculty member who he was, which is oh, cool. That's fantastic. <laughs> Yeah, the thing about this song, too, is uh, I mentioned this. Two things that came to my mind is you've heard the song Dare to be Stupid by yes. Weird Al. <laughs> yes. well, Dare to be Stupid is a, a Devo style song. It's not right. a parody of a exact Devo song. It is a style song. Yeah. So much so that Devo has said 
that it's their favorite Devo song. <laughs> Great. And it's so much a Devo song. I and mean, even lyrically, it's it's a Devo song. A lot like, but of course it's Weird Al doing a style parody. And this felt like Weird Al could have almost written this song if he was- Very doing... close. Yeah, if just a couple of jokes in it, yeah. that would have been the trick. And then you've got a song about uh, how much Weird Al liked the police and did a style cover versus an actual parody. <laughs> right, which would make a lot more sense than this song <laughs> and this person. Yeah. First of all, if you looking at Billy Joel, I would not think, oh, he's a police fan. Right, yeah. Doesn't seem like a, a guy. I mean, obviously he's a musician who appreciates good musicianship, but uh, just like a, a bro from Long Island. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Super into the police. I find what I I in the anytime I talk to an actual musician, I find that musicians are way more um, open to music than people who just enjoy music. So I think yeah. it doesn't surprise me too much because you'll find like somebody like who's in a say a metal band, but they're a really good musician. They also like country music. They yeah. don't have that weird demarcation in the sand where they're like well i like metal so i'm not allowed to enjoy country or whatever right. thing that yeah. we just tell us just good playing yeah wherever it, whatever genre it turns up in exactly and so i guess in that sense it doesn't surprise me but lord this is just it's just about stealing almost <laughs> <laughs> it's just about stealing it's almost mockery <laughs> uh, because it is not just uh I'm gonna like take some moves from the police and work them into my Billy Joel song. It's just like, I'm throwing out everything I do yeah. in favor of what they do, including trying to sing like Sting. Yes. Which is, they're in totally different registers. So it sounds crazy when he's trying to sing these high notes through his nose. Yeah. And then lyrically, it's very police-like. Uh, in like the linguistics tricks and the the syllable counts. Right, <laughs> absolutely. The theme of like, oh, we're all trapped in a rat race, you guys. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. you, know, you thought of Ghost in a Machine, I thought of Synchronicity. Yeah, it feels a little earlier than Synchronicity to me just because I also happen to be pretty wonky about the police because Synchronicity is an amazing album, but I've often thought that uh, Synchronicity is Sting's first solo album in a lot of ways. It's, yeah, okay, <laughs> yeah, I could say that. It's definitely him getting sick of the other guys and doing more of his own thing. But it also, because of that, gives you Mother, which I think is Stuart Copeland, which is just batshit insane, beautiful. I love that song. Right. I hated that song when I was a kid, by the way. Oh, really? I was too stupid. I didn't understand what oh. he was doing uh that oh, I, I think i related to it uh, way too hard <laughs> yeah i was like oh yeah yeah it was so just because it's not very musically uh it's not nice musically right it's oh. it, it's aggressively unpleasant to hear but that's it's on theatrical top. yes and also, it's nothing like the police. So you bought a police album and you're like, what the <laughs> hell is this? <laughs> yeah. Why is this here? And now it's it's gone from an, a song I didn't enjoy at all to being maybe my favorite song on the album for just how ridiculously quirky it is. It really jumps out. Yeah. And it's uh, and it 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 nails it. It does what it says it's gonna do. Like um, I often say defending your life is a perfect movie because it does exactly what the auteur wanted to do. Whether you think it's a great movie or not, it's a perfect movie. Yeah, okay. Because he accomplishes exactly, like Plain Strains and Automobiles is a different movie, is a good movie, but I don't think they accomplished what they wanted to accomplish exactly, so it's not a perfect movie. Because mm. they meant for that movie to be funnier. <laughs> and it's funny. <laughs> but, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, man, sidebar, sidebar, sidebar. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, well, you got to get there. Yeah, got to work into it. So then, when I also think of we watched uh, that thing you do. What did you watch? We watched uh, that thing you do. 
Oh, awesome. Which I consider pretty close to a perfect movie. Me too. And uh, pretty close to a uh, perfect like writing and directorial debut and first movie for your own indie company. Like the, that film was nailed it in so many different ways. <laughs> yeah, casting. Fantastic. Perfect casting. As long as we're sidebarring. Yeah. Oh. Perfect casting. Yeah, it's, uh, what, what's her name? The girlfriend, uh, what's the, uh, Liv Tyler, is that her name? Liv Tyler, yeah. I like her. She's I delightful. Like her. Yeah. <laughs> and it gets what, what's good about her in this movie. She, they capture what's exactly good about her is just how charming and how uh, she has a nice wayfish quality where you kind of do want to take care of her. You, it, it brings out that feeling that you have as a person where you want this person to be okay. Like, oh, I want this nice person to be okay. Yeah. So then when she gets finally at the end of the movie, spoilers, when, <laughs> when she ends up happy with the drummer, you're just delighted because you're like, that's what should have happened. Yeah. And it's pretty funny that the drummer is for some reason a good guy because that's not usually true. <laughs> not usually the case. And also a perfect uh, young Hanks. <laughs> oh, Yeah. Yeah, if Tom Hanks Tom Hanks was too old to play this part, we found the guy. We absolutely we found the guy. So I was also thinking about this song, the old running on ice, that I was like, it feels I've mentioned this before, but this is a good example of it, of uh his doing a thing the Beatles would do, which is I like the song this other group did. We should also do this. And uh maybe the Beatles did it a little more subtly. But also there were four of them, so they had the stuff to work with. Yeah. Um, something he's you know done more than once. Billy Joel has. He yeah. has that song that sounds exactly like the Stones. Um, that's not her style. Right. Exact Rolling Stones song. <laughs> Lots of attempts to be Ray Charles. Oh God, yeah. That's <laughs> that's I think maybe most of the career was about trying to be Ray Charles. Yeah and or the Beatles. When he leans too much into wanting to be Ray Charles, it can sometimes go, make him go, no. Yeah. Being the times when he's gotten to where he's influenced by, but not just trying to be, work fine. Yes. But you're not Ray Charles. You just weren't supposed to be Ray Charles. Yeah. And this song is uh, another example of like, putting on too many pieces of the costume. <laughs> yeah. The yeah. other thing that's jarring, so you do this thing that has a little bit of, I don't know, what would you call the police? Police were kind of ska, right? Yeah, ska. Yes, I think. So. Yeah, that sounds right to me. So you do that, but you do it with piano, which feels <laughs> like a mistake because it feels like, it feels like that's the instrument you use if you're just the songwriter and you deliver the tape to the actual band and go, I wrote this song. <laughs> right. Now you guys are ska, you'll obviously use your own instruments, but uh, here's, what it, here's what it should sound like roughly. There'll be horns, there'll be a bass player. One of your guys will be blonde and he'll sing. And then, you know. <laughs> and you know, suspenders and stuff. Yeah, but for some reason it's, it's ska, but with a piano, um, I suppose, it's better than had he gone full on to where we just went, what the hell are you doing? I, I don't know. I'm not sure which is better. <laughs> uh, this is better, I think. Um, I remember it's, I saw some interview with him where he was talking about We Didn't Start the Fire and how he had originally wanted to rap it and had to be talked out of it by his producer. <laughs> oh, my God. And uh, can you imagine the horror? Oh, uh, I... Because he has such a strong discography, so many great songs, kind of wish that would have happened. <laughs> Just to have it. <laughs> Something that far afield. Wow. Yeah. I remember seeing that and I thought, oh no, you, so you don't know anything about music? <laughs> <laughs> how, how is it possible you did all this without learning wh wow. where to stay out of? That's it's so none of your business. That's so wild. It's so wild. I would have, I would have enjoyed hearing that <laughs> because it just would have been so funny. Yeah. But I'll tell you what, I kind of feel like 
another album after that wouldn't have happened because i think that's enough of a like stop that people don't let you make another album if you do that you know what yeah, i mean like I get made fun of so much <laughs> so much I mean, it's made fun of a lot anyway. Yeah, but then you become like when MC Hammer tried to be hardcore. You remember MC Hammer did a hardcore oh, yeah. album? And it destroyed his him as a rapper because everybody's like, come on. Come on, you're the fun party rapper. You're not from the street. And with anyone, he did that sexy one where he was shirtless and they're like, come on, MC Hammer. <laughs> Stop it. Uh, you rap about how important it is to drink your milk. That's what you do. You rap about, you know, <laughs> for your SATs. Yeah. That's what you rap about. It's uh, yeah, it's what it's what uh, Garth Brooks did to himself with the Chris Gaines. Yeah. Did then you everybody like went, oh, oh, he's he's crazy. Okay. <laughs> no more albums for you. Am I the only one who? I guess I'm still the only one who kind of liked that. <laughs> I liked it as like a cultural phenomenon and like I can't believe this is happening <laughs> but I didn't like the songs I like uh, I guess so what he what he did with Chris Gaines hey uh, Billy Joel yeah just real quick because I know we're not talking about Billy Joel but it, it's pertinent yes I feel like what he was trying to do was something that Paul McCartney had wanted to do to go back to the Beatles Magical Mystery Tour, the original conceit of that is wouldn't it be great if we were a different band and we could just tour like we used to without people going crazy and we could just be musicians? Well, they used that as a thought experiment, but they didn't actually go out and tell people where. Yeah. You know, we didn't go say where these guys and put on the mustaches and the weird outfit. Whereas with the Chris Gaines, he was he took the same idea kind of, and he was like, "Nope, full on person all the way." Yeah, <laughs> I kind of like crap like that. So at the time, I thought, "Oh, that's neat." But then, yeah, you're right. Unfortunately, and this is his fault too. It is his fault. Unfortunately, the music wasn't that great. Wasn't that great, and he. Just, he can't sing without having a big old country twang. Hi, Sue. He can't sing without uh, twanging. So that whole album is like, oh, this just sounds like country rock that's yeah. not very good and maybe Christian. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which me and probably would have been a, a smarter move. I saw Sue. She ran in the back. She's still here. She made an appearance on the show. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you're credited yeah we got to get her to sign a release <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah because she will she's very litigious i think that's what you you said you first liked about her was this oh yeah we met in court <laughs> <laughs> uh, he hit my it's car funny. with her shopping cart it's funny i you mentioned the song and i was like damn i don't think i know this song but then when i listened to it i was like no i remember this song now it was just a song that came out at the time and disappeared pretty quick. Yeah. Like a lot of songs do. And then because it's not very Billy Joel, it's not going to make it on your regular list of just, I'm enjoying my days and I want to listen to some Billy Joel. You're not often going to go, oh, I'll include Running on Ice for sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no. It's a real, uh, it's a sidebar from him. Yeah. Instead of us for once. It's not, but it's not without merits. It's it's no. a fine song. I don't. I certainly don't hate it. I don't think I hate any Billy Joel songs. Um, there's just songs where I go, "Wow, this is hilarious." But there's no song. I I don't think there's any songs that I legitimately go, oh, "I don't like it at all." Are there any Billy Joel songs that you don't like at all? Um, there's one that he uh, lists as his least favorite that I have to agree is really terrible. Uh, you were the one where he sings half of it in French. Mm. Oh, it's uh, I. It's not that I don't like. It, like again, melodically, it's very nice. And yeah, then yeah. all of a sudden, he's singing in French, and it really is like a substitute French teacher of French. Yeah, that doesn't sound French, and it's. It, I don't hate it, but I do like 
curl up in a ball until it's over. Yeah. So I'll, I'll listen to the whole thing, but I'm just like, oh no, why did you do that? Who told yeah. me that was a good idea? No wonder you thought you could rap. Yeah. <laughs> Here's a testament to our fondness for Billy Joel, because when he does that, you get that feeling you get when a friend does something like that, which is you're like, oh, shoot. Oh. <laughs> right. Oh, no. If he asks me, I'll tell him. But otherwise, I'm just going to let it. <laughs> oh, what nice thing can I say when he's done? Right. The piano is great. Oh, yeah. The piano is great. I also like the French language. So you don't reference how he's speaking. It. <laughs> right. It is a beautiful language, isn't it? French is a beautiful language. Sometimes when you hear someone speak it, other people, not you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> How do you remember all those lines? <laughs> yes, yeah, so you clearly don't naturally speak it. <laughs> <laughs> hey, are you familiar with a uh, little bit of trivia? Are you familiar with the Shangri-Las walking on the sand? I have heard it. Why am I? I can't call it up right now. Um, walk it on the sand. Remember, remember. Oh no, <laughs> oh no, oh no, no, no. That song. Uh huh. What's well, uh be gotten a sort of second life on TikTok? I am not on TikTok, by the way. No, no. I think that's illegal. Yeah, no. You they check your ID. There's no way I'm allowed on TikTok. But that song has been used a lot. Now, the guy who wrote the song, I cannot remember his name. But he conned, he kind of conned himself into getting to record a song. And the song, he went to the studio and realized he didn't have a song ready or something. It's a weird story. So <laughs> he went to his car and he wrote a song really quick for his musicians and the Shangri-Las, which are girls in high school. Um, they got this 14-year-old kid to play piano on the song, uncredited and unpaid. It was Billy Joel. Oh, wow. <laughs> It was Billy Joel. Wow. I did not know that. Me neither. Fantastic. Uh, this uh, Mary Jo ran into that bit of trivia from a guy who is a mu mu musical historian who does that kind of stuff. And, and, no and it's notable that this damn TikTok, that TikTok is just using the song a lot. They just use the oh no part when people are getting hit in the nuts or falling down on ice. <laughs> Fantastic. So yeah, you can imagine what it is. But Billy Joel, uh, even at 14, getting ripped off. <laughs> right. <laughs> Not good with money. Setting a precedent that never stopped. He thought it was, I'll always be in music. No, no, no. It's, you'll always be in music getting ripped off by people who shouldn't do that to you. <laughs> you'll be in music longer than you think you have to be. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's okay. true. Amazing. Oh my God. So really uh, good one. I think we should start uh, digging into this. So it, it uh, so the song starts out very fast and it never lets up and you're yeah. right. That's very not Billy Joel. There's not a middle part where it slows down for a second. Um, no, I mean, there's a tiny bridge, but it's also stressful. Yeah. You got to run. And uh, why don't you uh, why don't you start with the lyrics for us? Okay. Immediately in the middle of it, there's a lot of tension in this town. I know it's building up inside of me. I've got all the symptoms and the side effects of city life anxiety. Now, see, w one thing that uh, helped when he was like, "Oh, I'm going to be like the police," is like this is lyrically better than a lot of his stuff. It actually is, yeah. It's like there's music to the language. Um, there's the uh, symptoms, side effects, city life. You know, yeah. what is that phenomenon called? Why can't I think of it? Alliteration. Yeah. A lot of good alliteration. Um, there's not a lot of that thing he does where he puts the wrong word at the end of the sentence just to make it rhyme. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Which drives me nuts. Um, and right away, I like. I like that you've you've told us there's a lot of tension in the town and, <laughs> and and you immediately build. You don't just keep telling me there's tension in the town. You tell me how it's affecting you. Yeah. And then then not only that, you tell me that now this is how it's affecting me, which are two more things than would normally be inside <laughs> that. Do you know what I mean? There's yes. 
He's communicating he's, way more than he normally would in that little lyric. Yes, and I'm looking at the last two lines feels like it could be kind of a thesis sentence for uh, most of what the police were doing. I got all the symptoms and the side effects of city life anxiety. Yeah. That is, I mean, all of synchronicity <laughs> is like, that's the thesis sentence. Yeah. I'm stressed out from living in society. Like, okay, it's not the freshest idea, but yeah. it's <laughs> nice and succinct. Can I tell you, by the way, I do think synchronicity top to bottom is one of the best of that kind of album, where yeah. it's uh, uh, an album that's meant to be enjoyed in its totality, not just the songs. I think it's one of the most successful ever as far as like really creating this thing. And a lot, there are so many failures on that road of albums yeah. that are meant to be seen as a piece of single art. But that one, I think, accomplishes it really well. Yeah. Every time I hear this song or any police song, I'm always kicked back to the lyric, uh, every single meeting with his so-called superior is yes. a humiliating kick in the crotch. <laughs> it's a humiliating oh. kick in the crotch. Yeah. Oh, fuck. That's, yeah. I mean, we, I think we were like working in restaurants yeah. <laughs> when that album came out. And I was like, oh, yeah. It, here's yeah. the thing, too. It's a great lyric. It. And, and Sting nails the delivery he's the perfect singer for that in in that moment because in that moment sting was a rock and roll singer he is not anymore yeah. not fine he's an old jazz musician who apparently has sex for a long time so he <laughs> that's, that's the word on the screen yeah <laughs> um but yeah that first lyric is pretty great uh why don't you go with the second one as well okay I could never understand why the urban attitude is so superior. In a world of high rise ambition, most people's motives are ulterior. Now that is a little bit of the flipping of the word order, but I'll accept it. Yeah. Because it, as a sentence, it's grammatically correct. Um, I, there's a lot of like city and urban. So is he coming from somewhere else? Yeah, that, I'm, that part I'm not, yeah, I'm not entirely understanding. <laughs> What we're saying here, I could never understand why the urban attitude is so superior. In a world of high rise ambition, most people's motives are ulterior. I actually do like that turn of phrase. Uh, I, I like the appearance of the word ulterior there, but, but what is the urban attitude? <laughs> urban attitude. It's a city life anxiety. Yeah. I think it's just um, feeling inferior. Yeah and not being able to keep up and feeling like everyone is out to get you in some way. Oh, um, and I, okay, and I, you're right. And I just, okay, I finally grokked onto what I think's going on here. I don't, I, know, I could never understand why the urban attitude is so superior. Meaning, I don't know why you think you're so great because this sucks. Why, <laughs> right. Okay, I get it now. I a little, Legit, I didn't get it, but. I could never understand. I also, I also like uh, in a world of high rise ambition. Yeah. It's a very police y yeah. met metaphor. Um, it, it, he doesn't, it doesn't get explained. It's just a very simple metaphor. It's like, oh, high rise. And, you know, uh, it's urban, it's high rises. So it's high rise ambition. I'm like, oh, that's a nice little, uh, almost like an advertising phrase. Yeah. And it's not, and as a listener, you can just understand it. He's, it's not a confusing metaphor at all. Yeah, it doesn't need four more lines to explain it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It tells you exactly why he's kind of pissed off at uh, a, having to go to a job that he's never had to go to. But still, but he can understand. <laughs> no. He can relate to it. Um, it is funny how much of music is about... Uh, it's terrible having a nine to five job and working in a cubicle. <laughs> right. <laughs> now, obviously a lot of musicians have done that or, or do have to do that until they make it. But I'm like, others have not had to. And yeah. there's not very, I mean, I guess the, in the music industry has its own version of I that particular feeling. Yeah. I suppose so. Although I think like, if we say we take your job, um, you, 
spend uh, probably an inordinate amount of time in front of a computer, right? Sure. Typing and stuff. But you're writing jokes and you like to write jokes. And you I, I like having written jokes. Yeah. Writing jokes, <laughs> it's, it's, yeah, it is like, it's labor in its way. I mean, well, absolutely. Uh, and I would never, and, and it is, and especially if you're doing it correctly, it is. Yeah. Because the difference, the thing that makes it uh, a cool job is not all, you know, the sitting around and typing jokes. It's at the end of the day when you get, you know, you get your, uh, your little doggy treat where an audience laughs at your jokes. Right. And like, oh, this is better. If I go, if I have an office job, I do that work all day long and then I just go home. <laughs> I don't know what happened to all the data I entered yeah. or whatever. It just goes away and I get a new stack tomorrow. Yeah. And there's no satisfaction. Yeah, you don't feel like you made a difference and maybe you yeah. did, but. I get like a little bow on the end of my day that makes it a very cool job. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So so my my point being, yeah, maybe music does have its, I know that sometimes being in a studio and recording can be, you know, a drag and whatever, but you're making music. And then if, when you're done, you have an album. Yeah. And, and <laughs> sometimes you have a hit album. And then, so it seems like very little to complain about really. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I well, your scale changes. Yeah, and, true. You know, I certainly learned is like, oh, uh, I got my dream job. And I live in New York City, and uh, I had like three days where I didn't complain, and then it all came back. <laughs> so there's new things. There's a new slate of issues uh, to complain about. Yeah, yeah, no, and of course it makes sense because once you get your dream job, you're like, ah, crap, I'm still me. Oh no. Yeah. That's yeah. constant. You know. Oh no, we're I, gonna find out. We're <laughs> gonna find out I'm still me. I have this experience when I go on the road. I've, I've said this before. When I'm in a hotel and they have a really big bathtub and, and there's a big bathtub and I go down and I do my show and, and you know, and I have a fun time and people laugh and I come back to my room and I fill the bathtub and I take a nice bath. I think, man, I have got a good life. I'm doing comedy for people. I'm, I'm living the great life. If I get to a hotel and they only have a shower while I'm showering, I think, the fuck am I doing with my life? <laughs> And it just, that's the difference. <laughs> it really is. Yeah. And you I, just have to hope you get enough bathtubs to make you feel like you are doing the right thing. <laughs> yep. And I, and it's, it's to the point now that when I get to a hotel and there's a shower, only a shower, I'm like, all right, I got a plan taking care of my psychology because this is going to come up. This is going to happen. <laughs> and it always happens at the same time for me because stand up has its own you know people who don't do drugs and drink on the road like myself it's mm -hmm. almost like we're doing it wrong because you're alone at three in the morning so often going yeah. oh the show was really good but now i have insomnia right and all there is down there is a casino and a vending machine cool oh. yeah and yet i still I fucking kill right now to have one of those gigs uh <laughs> <laughs> yeah i feel very lucky that i can still do my gig yeah dude um, even with fewer treats yeah it's yeah it's yeah any any bit of comedy i get to do right now is just i'm very very happy to be doing it and then i just try to remember all right you're not an I'm, I, I'm gonna tie it right back um this whole pandemic i mean the title of this song which we're going into now we're headed right for a chorus um this whole pandemic has felt like running on ice. Yeah. Ah. Oh. Yeah. How did he? How did he do it? <laughs> but it is. We're getting nowhere. Yeah. Sometimes I feel as though I'm running on ice, paying the price too long. Oh, what a great lyric! <laughs> For real, paying the price too long. Not too much. Fine with the price. Yeah. But still, like, still paying my dues. Paying my dues and what am I? And I still haven't gotten anything. Yeah. Yeah. Kind of get the feeling that I'm running on ice. Where did my life go wrong? 
yeah a little simplistic <laughs> yeah, yeah that part i'm not sure but paying the price too long is a great lyric yeah and where did my life go wrong is something that rhymes with paying the price too long. <laughs> yeah. That's, it is like, I have this great lyric. I can't change it. Yeah. But I got to rhyme it. Would oh, it be, God. would it have been better just asking if you flipped it only because then the part you like better would be the thing that you ended on. Sometimes I feel as though I'm running on ice. Where did my life go wrong? Kind of get the feeling that I'm running on ice paying the price too long oh that's a better lyric that is better you did it yeah because because then the neat part is last and you forget the first part yes you know i would also be fine with uh where did it all go wrong oh. i think there's something about my life went wrong yeah <laughs> just a little in broadway yeah absolutely yeah and and it's indicative of, of I'm doing something that's police like, but I'm not the police. I'm not the police. I'm still so, Billy Joel. I'm still the my life guy. Yeah. Where did my life go? Well, it went wrong when you closed up that shop. Went wrong when you, your main character left the song. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was very interesting. I'm a cosmopolitan, cosmopolitan sophisticate of culture and intelligence. Well, he's not, but that's okay. Very much not. Yeah, I'm a cosmopolitan sophisticate of culture and intelligence, the culmination of technology and civilized experience. I feel like this is the first thing he wrote. I feel like he sat and listened to a bunch of police albums and was like, ah, this is what they would write. Because <laughs> <laughs> it is very much on point if yeah. you were. If you wanted to like play some trivia game where you show like here are four stanzas, find the one that's not a police lyric, and you were trying to fool people, you might write this. Yeah, I'm a cosmopolitan sophisticate. <laughs> Again, it's great. It's better writing than he normally does lyrically. Yeah, it's a character because obviously he's not sophisticated. Um, intelligent is debatable. The culmination of technology and civilized experience is not what I think of. I think of uh, like a chubby guy with a motorcycle. Right. <laughs> <laughs> or a motorcycle collection. Yeah. Um, culmination of technology and civilized experience. Yeah, the, some of the, the first three verses I think are better than this, but this is still not bad. I'm a cosmopolitan sophisticated of culture and intelligence the culmination of technology and civilized experience. Yeah, I guess, yeah, we're very on the nose describing the box that we've put ourselves in. <laughs> yeah. In, in this crazy society of high rise. <laughs> high rise ambition. High rise ambition, yeah. It's still like, it really is funny how it, it does. He did a good job of it not sounding entirely like a Billy Joel song. So in that sense, I'd say it's a big success. Yeah. And already. a pretty good facsimile of a police song. You know, I had to, when I was in college, I uh, had a poetry class. And so we had to write poems and bring them in every week. And then one week they were like, uh, find a poet you like, a famous poet, and write one in their style. So it would be in indistinguishable from other things that they wrote. And so I did that. And it was like the best thing I wrote that, <laughs> in that whole class. And it sounded exactly like William Carlos Williams. Oh, funny. And it was, it was fun. And it took a lot of pressure off of you. So you're like, oh, I'm not, I don't have to have a style. I have a style already. It's this guy's. Right. And it's sort of very plug and play. And oh, it was, if you, you think you're putting yourself in a box, but it's actually very freeing in a lot of ways. And it feels like maybe that's what happened here. Yeah, yeah. Um, as a as a young man, you always think, you always feel constrained by rules and stuff. And as an older man, you realize uh, that uh, the rules are tremendously useful. And as yeah. they, as a good any good writing teacher will tell you, you cannot break rules until you know rules. Yeah, and you can function well within them. Yeah, and like, also. Like he never in a million years would have written these lines if he wasn't trying to do a police song. Yeah, true. 
yeah, you put the constraints on yourself. Well, you can say that so many art forms, you look at filmmaking and the best, the best Star Wars, the best George Lucas is George Lucas on a budget. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Best of so many filmmakers. And yeah. then you give them unlimited money and they lose their minds. Yeah, yeah. Because make Avatar. Because what does anybody always say is that you'll know that they say that you'll know your film is you're on the right track if you have to cut out your favorite scene. That's oh, very nice. Said it about a lot of movies and 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 it, and it makes so much sense because yeah. now you're not just patting yourself on the back. You're getting a product together. Right. Well, yeah, we say the same thing in our shows. Like if you're cutting good jokes, you're in good shape. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> in uh, you know. In stand-up, I always feel like a joke is really good when it wouldn't work another way. Yeah. I always like it when a joke when you're like, if you change the phrasing, this joke is is no longer funny, or yeah. it's maybe even not quite a joke. <laughs> right. I always think then you've really hit on something because then it, then well, for one thing, it meant the writing mattered, not yeah. just the idea. Yes. It's, Sometimes comedic, you know, we all know that in comedy, sometimes you'll hit an idea and it's just the idea is funny enough and it carries the day. Sometimes, but if your writing is on point, yeah. And, you know, as a writer, I'm handing all my stuff to other people to say. So I'm like, the writing has to be on point because I can't tell them, like, emphasize this word. Right, yeah. <laughs> a lot of times I'm emailing the shit out and just like, just say this however you say it and it should work. And it should be perfectly you, you try to delivery proof it. Uh, by the way, I enjoyed Seth the other day doing um, a Dennis Miller. That was very enjoyable. <laughs> we uh, we can't, we're addicted to putting in references that our audience is too young for. <laughs> I mean, I mentioned I put in the Texaco Star Theater <laughs> just to see how far back we could push it. That's pretty great though, because I'm too old for that technically. So So I. I'm like, I don't I was and maybe no, I was not alive. It was like fifty-eight. <laughs> no, you weren't. So the nice thing is for a joke like that, it's it's I so like clearly it. for nobody. Yeah. That so it then, becomes for everybody in a way. Exactly. The person that it hits for, it's gonna hit for beautifully because they're gonna they're going to be mad and amused. They're like, why? What? I like that kind of stuff. In <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's a texture. They just can't all be the same laugh. There has yeah. to be outrage and disappointment <laughs> and <laughs> sadness. And, yeah. Um, it, here's where we hit something. The next stanza starts with, but, but I'm carrying all the weight of the useless junk a modern man accumulates. Get rid of but, right? No, keep the butt. The butt makes the makes the point. Does it? I'm a cosmopolitan sophisticate of culture and intelligence, the culmination of technology and civilized experience. Oh, okay, no, you're right. Okay, yeah. have a nice day then. <laughs> no, no, no. But I'm unhappy. Yeah. Despite being sophisticated and intelligent and having all this technology, I'm carrying the weight of all the useless junk a modern man accumulates. I'm a statistic in a system that a civil servant dominates, my favorite two lines. Yeah, that's a great Just one. alliteration and syllables, and it's nice, and it's like nothing he does <laughs> <laughs> the rest of his career. And it's so stingy, so policey. Yeah. I feel like there are 14 words in this song that don't appear anywhere else in his catalog. <laughs> It's funny too to say that it's very much sting, but it's sting the police sting. Yeah, it's sure. the police sting, and it's like a heightened version. That it's like what it sounds like to the kind of dopey guy on Long Island. <laughs> it's like, oh, he says stuff like this, and I think if you look at the police lyrics, it'd be like, no, it seems like that. <laughs> <laughs> because we do use some big words, but we don't put them all in every song. <laughs> you, this is like a clown version of what they do. Yeah. I ignoring the fact that sometimes... Um, I mean, 
They, sometimes they say things like humiliating kick in the crotch. Exactly. Yes, yes. <laughs> well, it's not all fancy they, language. They say some guttural things. It's just, it's all this is, is uh, ah, Sting went to school. Yeah, and I didn't. So uh, people who go to school, let me see. I'll look up some words. <laughs> Cosmopolitan, civilized, culmination, ulterior. Yeah, that's the kind of words they use. And yet he is fucking nailing it, though. He's nailing it. Take, it's divorced of the music. This is a better song than it is on the music because the music's okay. Music's okay. But the lyrics by themselves, and, and now that's kind of weird now that, <laughs> now that I think about it because most of the, so in the first five episodes of this show, this long running show of ours, Mm -hmm. um the one of the key observations is that the songs are just beautiful mm -hmm. and the lyrics are sometimes good and sometimes whatever but this is the opposite this is yeah. the, the music's okay but yeah. divorced of the song the lyrics are actually pretty fantastic i would love to know uh, how long this took him because i feel like he probably worked harder on these lyrics than any other song uh, yeah. because he has to sing so fast and so high yeah it has to be exactly right you can't cheat the syllables nope that all has to land perfectly and look at this next lyric how uh you know some some uh very lovely lyrics in other songs that then kind of get a little repetitive this yes. look at this and all that means is that i'm running on ice caught in a vice so strong so we're back to talking running on ice but he doesn't just repeat the chorus yeah. from before he goes deeper onto how he's feeling <laughs> right and gives us new lyrics to to feel that with him and all that means is that i'm running on ice caught in a vice so strong that, that's a great lyric great lyric. i'm slipping and sliding because i'm running on ice where did my well? Where did my life go wrong? <laughs> sure, sure. But uh, but actually, you know what's funny? I like the second "Where did my life go wrong" better than the first anyway. Just yeah, because now you're reiterating, and I I'm like, okay, man, you are upset. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, that's the place for it. Yeah, that actually. The first one could have been something different, but this is the place for it. Yeah, in fact, if it was. Where did if it was where did it all go wrong and where did my life go wrong? Actually, might have been nice too, but that's a small quibble from two guys who are not famous rock stars. No, so far, so far, that's right. <laughs> uh, I do like that he spends a lot of time using giant words and explaining all this stuff, and then goes to all that means <laughs> is that I'm right. <laughs> Look, I'm using a lot of big words here, but what I'm saying is I'm not getting anywhere. <laughs> That's the conversation. The big words are the conversation you have at the beginning of a cocktail party. The other right. words are after you've had like two more drinks than you should have. Right. Like all I'm fucking saying. This is all. Yeah, I know I called myself a cosmopolitan, but look. It's all bullshit. I'm not getting anywhere, man. Yeah, like I said. Where did my life go wrong? And then there's that weird little bridge that's just you got to run. <laughs> <laughs> you've got to run oh by the way now it's you and not i oh that's true now he's yeah now, that matters now he's giving us advice <laughs> you've got to run i think it's like one one has to run it's yeah. that you oh yeah yeah he, he's still you've got to run you've got to run he's he's self <laughs> self-flagellating yeah or what is that thing you do when you encourage yourself <laughs> You're asking the wrong guy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's officially yeah. my favorite joke of this episode. <laughs> Positive self-talk? Yeah. Some version of that? Well, um, I used to videotape every performance of mine, and I learned something about myself, thankfully, from doing that. When I was doing stand-up, and I, I would have these really good sets, and I would think, I guess I'm more secure now. And I realized I noticed I would rub my elbow a lot. Huh. And so I so I'd have the microphone and I'd see that I'm rubbing my elbow. Oh, and I sure. stopped doing that. And I was like, why am I doing that? 
So I actually took the time to research. Why was I doing that? And what I was doing was there's a subconscious thing you do when you self comfort yourself to go, you're, it's okay. It's all right. <laughs> yeah. It's all yeah. Right. You're like covering. Yeah. You're going, it's, it's this, it's like somebody else patting you on the back. Uh, people do it when they lie a lot. You'll see that people will do oh, yeah. that kind of stuff when they lie and they'll kind of, and, um, and performing sometimes there is a deep, there is a little lie at the back of it, which is that I'm confident. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. And it was really good to tape myself and go, all right, fucko, stop doing that. Cause it, and then <laughs> I don't do that anymore just cause I've trained myself not to. It um, is fascinating to watch uh, like young comics and see all their various mechanisms for that. Yeah. Uh, sitting down. Some guys are like, oh, I'm going to sit on the stool the whole time and sort of curl forward. Yeah. Uh, but there's I, like, yeah, a lot of arm tricks. <laughs> I <laughs> like resting this hand on this hand with oh, the yeah, mic. that thing yeah <laughs> and um, i'll tell you what just as a performer what i've noticed is if you take the microphone out you just talk into it the audience is much happier yes because they are now they become comfortable that oh he knows what he's doing right so whether i enjoy the jokes or not he at least knows what he's doing yeah. i don't have to worry about him yeah that this is going to go off the rails and yeah a lot of performers don't think about that like oh they're worried about you until you signal to them to relax yeah so you do that first yep i uh and then the other thing i've learned is um not everyone every crowd wants to hear me talk about my brother's suicide oh huh. i think i've learned no casino crowds they, they don't yeah i don't do that on the road <laughs> okay keep working on it there are crowds that love it which is great is that great or is that equally weird <laughs> <laughs> well the jokes are solid it's just okay the, the <laughs> behind the jokes are always yeah yeah all right um yeah uh, we've had some time to work on it <laughs> oh yeah but that's a good lesson to learn too because when i was a young comic i would just do whatever because i'm like they're my jokes i'm like well yeah but you also want to get paid <laughs> yeah they're this is for them yeah. as well it's not just for you exactly and ideally it's supposed to be more for them right i do remember you being on stage once with a small plastic devil's fork do you have any memory of this yes at the kill of mockingbirds maybe had a, a like a halloween devil's fork and i all i remember is you saying that you were going to put it in this lady's ass as she was heckling you I'm going to put this in your ass. And it's just a flash that stayed with me for some reason. And I was oh. like, oh, that's what you mean. That yeah. sort of hostility to the audience. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, We've uh, gotten off track. Yeah. I've developed a gentler hand with handling hecklers, but I still don't understand why you go to a show and think, ah, I should talk. I still doesn't. It's an ongoing sense. mystery, but it's one of those things where you have to be like, well, there it is a phenomenon that is just going to keep happening. Yeah. So maybe it's better to figure out a strategy than an origin story. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Half the time. Yep. They're, yeah, they're, they're out there. Fucking All God right. Knows why. As fast as I can climb a new disaster every time I turn around, as soon as I get one fire put out, there's another building burning down. We've got a couple disasters in here. Okay. Because it kind of feels yeah, like a lot. Now we're, I feel like we're getting repetitive. Yeah. There's a lot of ways to describe the same feeling. Yeah, true. I, um, I do like that it's not repeating anything, but you're right. It is the same idea. Right. They say I feel overwhelmed. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I really like the internal rhyme in the first two lines. I can or the, uh, uh, what is it called when the vowel sound is the same, not the first letter? As fast as I can climb a new disaster every time I turn around. Yeah. I used to know all the literary terms, alliteration and anastrophe. <laughs> and I've lost track. Anastrophe, by the way, is the inversion of the regular word order. Okay, so Billy Joel does that a lot. Yeah. Tonic and gin, everybody. <laughs> 
Um, but yeah, that's it's a nicely written little stanza that isn't really giving us any new info. Yeah, which is okay as long as the lyrics good, right? Because I mean, it's a song, yeah, so. it's like the the music of the language is good and it carries it. Yeah, fast as I can climb a new disaster. And it's almost like a rap thing, the internal. Oh, he should have rapped it. <laughs> Don't tell him. <laughs> they, I also like the next line. They say this highway is going my way, but I don't know where it's taking me. Another internal rhyme. Yeah. It's a. But, <laughs> this is a weird turn. When, real, real quick though. Just picture this. He wraps mm -hmm. it so that the word is, as fast as I can climb, yo. That's what he says. <laughs> Just imagine it. Billy Joel saying that. He would. And then he would do this at the end. end. A new disaster every time I turn around, yo. <laughs> Billy, no. Uh, oh. Is this our side project, by the way? Is our side project like to help, you know, get like Patreon subscriber, subscribers is you and I record Billy Joel covers that are all rap? <laughs> if it brings the money in. Yeah. I'm down. <laughs> I am down too, yo. Oh no. <laughs> Let's get a TikTok account and see what we can do. They say this highway is going my way, but I don't know where it's taking me. It's a bad waste, a sad case, a rat race. It's breaking me. That's where he sort of breaks out of the rhythm of the song a little bit. Yeah. It did remind me of the humiliating kick in the crotch line because that jumps out of that song and doesn't fit into the lyrical structure anymore. Yeah. Just sort of yelling now. Mm. Um, it also reminded me of uh, Glass Houses. It's new funk, what is it? New funk, old punk. Oh yeah. Old it reminded me of that. But it's, yeah. it's breaking him. Yeah, they say this highway's going my way. And I don't, who's, they say this highway's going my way. Okay, I get the lyric. I was struggling with it for a second. They say this highway's going my way. So the man. The man, the people the, around him. Are telling you, you got this. This is wonderful. These are the people whose motives are ulterior. Yeah. <laughs> the other people who are struggling just like he is, but won't admit it. Yeah, and so now they're talking it up. This is yeah, you got yeah, this. Man. Time is on your way, bud. I feel like there, uh, there's a lot of cocaine implied in this song. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then another uh, verse, another coda, with different lyrics again. I get no traction because I'm running on ice. It's taking me twice as long. I get a bad reaction because <laughs> I'm running on ice. Where did my life go wrong? I like I got I get no traction. I what does I get a bad reaction mean? I get a bad reaction. Because I get no traction, I get. Right. As a working right. person, when you feel like you're running in place, that's great. That's sad and frustrating and perfect. I but I get a bad, bad reaction. reaction. From those from they, from the highway people. <laughs> yeah but i don't know because those people seem to think the highway's going his they're trying to tell them everything's going great yeah you got this so th i don't know if they'd give him a bad reaction i feel like he has a bad reaction so he's having the ba bad reaction to it yes it should be that yeah i have a bad reaction because i'm running on ice I get a bad reaction. Yeah, I guess I, I get a bad reaction is a an elegant way to say I have a bad reaction or I'm having a bad reaction. Like the same way you would get a cold. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I got like, well, I got no traction because I'm running on ice. It's taking me twice as long. I like that lyric a lot. But I get a bad reaction because I'm I get a bad reaction because I'm running on my on ice. Where did my life go wrong? It's all self-reflection. So whatever yeah. this bad reaction, it's internal. Yeah. It's, and it's a and it's a small quibble when you consider the lyrics as a whole, because the lyrics as a whole, it's funny because 
when I'm listening to the song the first time when you you suggested it, I and I remembered the song. I was remembering now. Yeah, this song is kind of ridiculous. It's very much a police song, but then the damn lyrics are great. <laughs> <laughs> they are really good. He did a really good job. Yeah, yeah and you. you know? I don't know what if you just saw these lyrics and somebody said, "Hey, they're uh, this is a Billy Joel song." Try it. Sing what you think it sounds like. <laughs> <laughs> I oh. don't think you'd get anywhere near it. Yeah. And I think it's a short one. I feel like it has a very short runtime. Yeah. Despite having a ton of lyrics. Which is definitely the opposite. Again, it's just def or not maybe not the opposite, not the exact opposite, but definitely goes a different direction than he usually does. Be there, yeah. It's very economical in that regard. Uh, mm -hmm. The lyrics and this is me expressing this idea a multitude of ways, not a lot of repetition. The little bit of repetition that there is feels like from a just purely song standpoint makes sense. Running on ice and all that stuff. You're going to say that because that's because that evokes an image anyway yes it's very close to a huge success it's weird <laughs> it is weird it's a i feel like it's a huge success in a, a an area that doesn't care <laughs> it's like it's almost like he got that assignment that i got in college and somebody said make a police song and he's like "Fuck yeah and he nailed it but yeah. nobody asked. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's the thing. He gave himself an internal assignment and people are like, okay, yeah, you succeeded at the thing that nobody wanted or asked for. Do you think listening to the song and it's not even, it's not even bad music. It's good, perfectly good music. It's perfectly serviceable tune. Do you yes. think the song would have been a bigger success if he had just put it in his register and not done the trying to sound like Sting thing? I don't. I don't because lyrically it's not a Billy Joel song. Okay. So if, like, why is he very singing this very slow piano song <laughs> about being a cosmopolitan sophisticate? Well, I, not the speed part. Keep the speed, just the register. Oh, the register. Bring it down, uh, just bring it down into a more manageable uh, place for him to sing it. Yeah, then it almost, I think, would sound like Gilbert and Sullivan or something. Yeah. <laughs> like a patter song. But that's okay for Billy Joel, like we've said. I think that's okay, yeah. Theater. He's got a little bit of musical theater. Like you said, mu musical theater for heterosexual nerds. <laughs> that's, I read that somewhere. Yeah. And, uh, and I like Gilbert, Gilbert and Sullivan too, so that's fine. Um, it's, it's, I, I'm, I'm struck by how long I forgot this song exists, and how when I realized it does exist, it put me in a particular place of hearing the song, and I want to say, hearing the song and going, oh, this is okay, but then never hearing it again. Never hearing it again. There's no place in the world for it. Yeah. So it, if you wanted to play it on like Top 40 radio or something or old age station, you would just play a police song. Yeah. <laughs> you would just go, this, is, this yeah. reminds me of these six or eight better songs. Let's play one of those. Yeah. Let's play Don't Stand So Close to Me. Yeah, the only way you're hearing it is if you're hearing on the radio is if it's one of those shows where they play a whole album. Yes. And it's and then you're like, oh, his B sides are weird. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I love the hits, but the B sides are cuckoo. You know what I'll say about Billy Joel's B sides, though, because they are a little wacky, but a lot of bands, their B sides are just shitty. Yeah. Just, they went into the studio and they had to record another album. So a lot of times, especially older artists, B sides are like a cover because we needed a mm. song. And here's a song we don't have to pay royalties for. Right. So it's all of that nonsense. Yeah, Where? not a lot of time wasted on covers. Yeah. Um, yeah, usually it's like a, 
an interesting but failed experiment or something. Yeah. So listen, to help promote our show, I, oh. I joined uh, on Facebook, I joined the Billy Joel um, fan page, which has millions of people on it, by the way. Rightly so. And they post a lot of stuff. And I did not know this, but there'll be people who post stuff that goes, Billy Joel is way better than Elton John. <laughs> huh. uh, which is an argument no one's having. No, I don't think so. <laughs> was that ever a thing? I don't think it ever was. I think there was an implied rivalry because they were both piano guys. Yeah. But I don't think, I don't know if they felt that. That's the thing. They're is doing I, very different things. Yeah, I don't think they ever were participating in this rivalry. But on the, if you went by the Billy Joel fan page, it's still going. <laughs> oh yeah, I re I can remember like in high school years when people were like, "Who do you like, Prince or Michael Jackson?" <laughs> I'd be like, I have access to both. Really? <laughs> <Very nice. laughs> no one has to win that. <laughs> like, and also, they're wildly different. The other thing is this guy posted on the Billy Joel fan page. I think you'll enjoy this. This oh guy boy. posted on the Billy Joel fan page and he was clearly joking, I have to say. By the way that he phrased it, he goes, <laughs> okay. by the just the nature of what he had said, he said, he goes, you know, I love seeing Billy Joel in concert, but uh, put out a new album, man. Don't be so lazy. So, <laughs> and he's joke. He's clearly joking. I hope so. Yeah, he's just joking. And man, the thunder that came down on this guy from the rest of the Billy Joel community was great. <laughs> and then I found out for sure he's joking because he's like, look, I'm just... And then the next day that guy posted, yesterday I made a post and maybe I wasn't very clear in what I was trying to say as I was just saying, I love Billy Joel of course I would love new music, <laughs> but Amazing. it was really funny to watch them go <laughs> after him. Cause I'm like, I'm all I'm doing is I'm saying, Hey, me and my friend have this thing you might enjoy. Right. That's all I'm saying. And, uh, and, and some of the people post, man, it's, it's fandom is an interesting thing because they've got pictures with Billy and it's very cool. And one person says, one person posted something I liked as he goes, hey, if another one of you wants to uh, post a thing about why he doesn't have a Christmas album, he's Jewish. Shut up. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Because I was going to bring that up too, because I thought that I think it's kind of awesome that he doesn't have any Christmas music. Yeah, it's fantastic. He does have one uh, kid song. Do you know that one? No. Well, that'll be my trivia question then. <laughs> oh, okay, cool. It's on, oh God, it, I do, will not remember the name of the album, but it's similar to the, uh, that album that Marlo Thomas did in the 80s. Free to be, Free to be, you, be you and me. me. It was a similar album where they were like, hey, famous recording artists, can you write one song to uh, help kids feel better about themselves? Oh. And he was like, sure, I'll do that. <laughs> and he, <laughs> that's how he talks. Um, and so he has a song called I Got a Friend. And uh, it's about uh, his relationship with his imaginary friend. Oh. And it's fucking great. And it's uh, like a, a rockin' song. It's not very original. It's very like, it sounds like something that would have been on Bruce Willis's little album. Oh, yeah. The Richard Bruno. Bruno and the Accelerators. Yeah. <laughs> um sometimes i'll rem like i'll remember something like somebody like you just brought up uh, bruce willis's album and i'll remember that it was like i think it was called the return of bruno or something yes and uh i'll be disappointed in my brain for remembering that <laughs> i'll be disappointed in myself because i bought it and then uh having seen the title i looked for the original bruno album oh nice because <laughs> i was like oh this is the return of bruno there must be another album that I can buy. And uh, I hope I didn't ask a clerk. <laughs> um, also, that album brings me to one of my favorite jokes I ever wrote for Weekend Update a million years ago. Oh, but. Uh, was um, Bruce Willis's band, 
Bruce Willis and his band, The Accelerators, are uh, going on a 13-city tour this fall. Tickets will go on sale anyway. <laughs> One of my faves. That's great. <laughs> great joke. Thank uh, you. What? There was a joke I submitted when I was submitting to SNL, and then you guys did the joke, but I could tell that somebody else thought of the same joke. I was like, oh, that's a lot. But it's still one of my favorite jokes because um, it was a, the premise, the story was it turned kids in Boston. It turns out kids under 10 years old in Boston are drinking a cup of coffee a day. And my joke was, I go, of course they are. How else are you going to beat the hangover? Fantastic. Yes. It's a great joke. And then however you guys phrase it, I was like, ah, that's better. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It, uh, that'll drive you nuts. And you're like, oh, oh my God, God. yes. Oh, I was in the neighborhood and I didn't. It yeah. also, it, uh, it's a good lesson to learn because when you first do stand up and you'll think of a joke, I don't care how dumb your joke is. You think you're the only one who thought of it. So when you first do a joke, you yes. go, hey, that guy stole my knock knock joke. And you could think <laughs> that. Right. You know, 19 year old you was like, I'm going to go fight that guy. He did that knock knock joke of mine. I did last week in a different city. Yeah. Obviously, he heard about it. Exactly. And now, if a guy gets on stage and goes, Hey, everybody, it's good to see you. My name's Jim Bruce. I know that's what, uh, and let me tell you a little bit about myself. I'll still think eh, this might be a coincidence. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> What do I know? Maybe that guy's name is Jim Bruce. Why would why would somebody say that? Why would you lie about that? <laughs> um, I have a staff now of eight writers who send me monologue jokes every day. Right on. I think young comedians would be shocked to find how many times I see the same joke in the course of a day. They all get setups sent to them. Yeah. And I'll get like four versions of the exact same joke which drives me crazy because I'm like, you know this happens. Why didn't you think of a different thing? But obviously it's volume business. So <laughs> they like, are cranking out jokes and they're like, oh, this. And then they move on. And I'm like, yeah. And they're like, oh, so we're going to do it? I'm like, no, we're not going to do it. If four of you thought of it, okay. obviously you're not going to surprise the audience <laughs> with this punchline because right. 15 of them probably thought of it. <laughs> um, so real quick before I forget, uh, so, so check out my background. And cafe. Yeah. You know what happens there? I don't. Really? I don't. I'm lost. Oh, really? Grand cafe. Well, I'll tell you something. All the waiters at that. I'm doing place. this to try to remember. All the waiters in your grand cafe. They leave their tables when you blink. That's right. His most obvious uh, Beatles ripoff that song oh yeah i love that song too it's guitar driven which is unusual yeah, acoustic yeah. guitar driven it is a fun little ditty isn't it and listen to it again because he sings it with a little bit of a british accent ah <laughs> I'm looking, okay yeah the yeah. grand cafe all the waiters in your grand cafe yeah uh that by the way is some is somewhere in new jersey if uh Anybody there wants to do a tour of uh, things mentioned on our podcast? <laughs> uh, I will go with you if you volunteer to do that. I would, I would enjoy that. I would enjoy spending some time with you regardless. So that would be nice, of course. Great. <laughs> Once the vaccine comes, we're, we're, we're going to get a bus. Oh. <laughs> we're going to take people to Houston and Grand at mulberry street yep oh I'm just God. down the street from the empire diner and parts of phoenix because we've mentioned that right <laughs> and every location mentioned in we didn't start the fire yes so it's a long drive to lebanon <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right i'm right. gonna tell you uh i want to tell you next week's Sh uh, song Please. i've been struggling to pick the one not struggling to pick a song but struggling to pick which one because they're you know when you start looking at all the songs you like and you're like do i pick a, a funny weird one do i pick just one i like 
And I think this time I'm just going to pick a song I really like, but I think there's something peculiar about it and we'll have to figure that out. But okay. uh, there, uh, Vienna. Vienna. It is I think his best song. Yeah? Yeah. If someone said, what is your favorite? What is the best song? I think I'll pick Vienna. Yeah. Vienna is a very pretty, pretty song. And it seems, uh, it seems very on point with what he's trying to tell. It's, an, it's definitely another advice song. It's got <laughs> advice yeah. Song. yeah, an early one. Yeah. But this seems like less uh, aggressive. This is just very nice advice from a good friend, I feel like. Yeah. And some of the best piano in his whole catalog. Really pretty. Yeah. When I'm, uh, when I'm down or, or not even just down, but when I'm just, I, I just need to calm down. Maybe this is a good song for me as just kind of to listen to. Yeah. And it's just very pleasant and, uh, overall just kind of a nice, it just will settle me, It'll just yeah. settle me when I'm, when I'm dealing with anxiety. So, so you've been hearing a lot of it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to check it out as soon as we are off the air. Yeah, you know what? The cool thing, too, is I like about our, I like a couple of things about our show. One, I adore you. Oh, um, thank you. Two, my homework is always go listen to a neat song. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and so sometimes what I'll do is I'll put it on repeat in my car just because. And then I'll go, ah, okay, I can't listen to Running on Ice 10 more times. So I'm going to listen to some other stuff. <laughs> right. Then I'll listen to some other stuff, which is very nice. And then um, I'll hear something like My Baby Grand with the Ray Charles song. Mm -hmm. and I'll go, whew, not sure I like this song. But I do like Ray Charles, so I'll go listen to Ray Charles. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's, a, it's like a, it's the old-fashioned version of the YouTube. Yeah. Whole. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. The old rabbit hole. Yeah. And, uh, and okay, good. I didn't know you liked Vienna so much because I do too. Oh, yeah. Fantastic. It's hard not to like. Um, I think my favorite song most of the time is Scenes from an Italian Restaurant. I just really like yeah. it. Like, but Vienna is pretty as hell. Pretty as hell. It's just a pretty old, good song. Great. I'll look forward to that. Me too. All right, folks. We are going to, um, anyway. Before the next episode, if you get a chance, go to the Grand Cafe. Okay, get some takeout. Because <laughs> I think everything's shut down again. Is everything shut down there again? Everything is, uh, no, not fully. You can probably sit outside over there <laughs> at the Grand Cafe. But I wouldn't go there anyway, because the waiters just will leave your table. Yeah. And when Somebody this blinks, one leaves, when and they're this gone. One yeah. yeah, service there is garbage. Yeah. Get, get delivery. <laughs> All right. We'll see you next week, everybody. Take care of yourselves. Bye.